transmitted infection. Please take a moment and stop this presentation to review the learning objectives detailed in this slide. Sexually transmitted infections, STIs, also known back in the day as sexually transmitted diseases, STDs or venereal diseases, represent a diverse group of infections that have in common the fact that they will spread through sexual activity. Um, we do prefer nowadays to use the term of STIs, uh, mainly because um, we are trying to emphasize that a person can be infected without even experiencing symptoms of the disease. So, and because of that, the sexually transmitted infection represents a significant public health problem. Inside this category, may have we may encounter um, other conditions that can spread by additional routes as well, let's say HIV, or hepatitis or skin infections or infestations, uh, all those can spread through additional routes as well. However, they will be discussed as a sexually transmitted infection as well. And in the wide range of pathogens that can uh, generate a sexually transmitted infection, we have all kinds of, from bacteria to fungi, parasites, protozoan and viruses, all of them can be found in the same big categories. There are some STIs that are considered reportable conditions um, and they require a national reporting to the Center for Disease Control and Prevention, to the CDC. And those will be chlamydia, gonorrhea, hepatitis B, HIV, syphilis, and the chancroid. Recently, there is a new added uh, condition to the list, which is the Zika virus. So the reporting infections with human papilloma virus is not required. And despite of that, this is one of the most common STIs in the United States. So all those reportable conditions, we will discuss them in this presentation, and you will see that they are actually um, easily treatable and curable with the early and adequate treatment. There are some elements that I would like to discuss here and mention them that are related to an increased incidence of STIs. And those can be classified of either social or sexual or biological factors. And I will, I will just let you know what are those elements, those factors. There is an ignorance of how STIs are transmitted or prevented. There is a lack of information out there in the general population regarding how those infections will be transmitted or they can be prevented. There are, in many cases, asymptomatic sexual partners. Casual sex with partners about, about there is little to be known. Sex with high-risk partners, uh, such as those that may use IV drugs, they are bisexual, um, they are having uh, sex with prostitutes. Um, they may be multiple concurrent or sequential sexual partners. Another factor will be the failure to use contraceptive techniques that will, in fact, can reduce the risk of acquiring an STI. The sexual contact during the period between infection and the manifestation of symptoms when the patient is actually asymptomatic but infected and can pass it over. Failure to seek early treatment, even when the first signs are perceived, a lot of the patients, the clients will ignore them. Non-adherence to treatment or failure to refrain from sexual contact until treatment is complete. And the last one, but very important in a way, is the mutation and resistance of microorganisms to antimicrobial drug therapy. Question number one, is the following statement true or false? Three STDs are easily cured if caught early and treatment is completed as prescribed. The statement is true. There are three STIs that are easily cured if caught early and the treatment is completed as prescribed and they are chlamydia, gonorrhea, and syphilis.
Let's define epidemiology. Epidemiology represents the study of the occurrence, distribution, and the causes of human diseases. Um, the organization that in the United States is gathering the disease statistics, um, including, let's say, the incidence of STIs is the Center for Disease Control and Prevention, the CDC. However, in order to find out if the exact what is the exact incidence of those diseases it is very difficult because only a few of those are reportable by law. More than that, even among those that are reportable by law, a lot of the cases are undiagnosed or untreated. Some are treated and unreported, and some are even misdiagnosed. So reporting of new STI cases is the responsibility of every single healthcare provider or every single testing laboratory that finds a positive client or a positive um, um, test. The reporting is confidential and is protected from a subpoena. So on the other hand, this reporting that is highly inaccurate and, and hard to relate on it when we are looking at the numbers, for some reason will be disproportionately higher among racial and ethnic min minorities. And this differences in the reported numbers comes from the limited access to healthcare, from poverty, and from the actual higher rates of disease that occur in the communities where sexually active people have a greater potential for finding a partner that will be infected. In addition, we can say that more reporting by, there is a, is a more consistent reporting by public health clinics um, where this type of population will usually seek, um, seek treatment. So whenever we have um, a client that is new, we need to include in the, in the history um, of that client, um, thorough sexual history. And this is crucial um, in the assessment, especially for those that may have a, a, a vague uh, idea that they are searching for, looking for medical treatment because of an STI. Um, and the critical questions will include the five Ps. We'll interview about sexual partners, we'll inquire about sexual practices, we'll inquire about what are their pregnancy prevention methods, what are their protection methods from STIs, and another P is the past history of STIs. So we have five Ps, partners, practices, pregnancy prevention, STI prevention, and past history of STIs. So just to summarize what I was saying before, the reported incidence is not always um, accurate, due to those four elements, limited access to healthcare, poverty, an actual high rate of disease occurrence and more reporting by the public health uh, clinics. Infection with chlamydia trachomax. So chlamydia uh, infections are the most common nationally reportable STIs in the United States with the numbers for the year 2014, uh, being almost one and a half million. However, in reality, the infection with HPV, the human papillomavirus infection, is way more common, however, underreported. So when we are talking about chlamydia, the positive microorganism is chlamydia trachomatis. It's a bacterium that lives inside the cells once they are infected. The infection will be transmitted by sexual intercourse or any type of genital contact, even without penetration. Usually the microorganism invades the reproductive structures, um, leading to in women, uh, mostly to what is called a pelvic inflammatory disease, the PID. We'll go through the urethra in women, uh, through the urethra and invading the epididymis in the men, producing what is called urethritis. There will be a tissue, tissue irritation once the infection um, is um, um, occurred. 
once the infection occurs. And this tissue irritation may linger along and will stay longer despite um, the successful eradication of bacteria. Because of this tissue irritation that lingers longer, this element will expose uh, the clients to a greater risk for acquiring other STIs in the future uh, or concomitant in the same time with chlamydia. And those um, other STIs can be gonorrhea or HIV. Untreated, the condition can lead to uh, sterility, mainly in women, as a result of scarring tissue at the level of the reproductive system. An infected pregnant woman can transmit the microorganism um, to uh, the baby, mainly during birth. There is another type of spreading of chlamydia infection that is um, to the eyes and what it's called auto inoculation or the self transmission by touching the area of the face and the eyes with unwashed um, hands. What is interesting in terms of assessment of a uh, infection with chlamydia is that up to 75% of the infected women, which means three out of four, in one of the four of the men, they will be completely asymptomatic. They will have no signs of symptoms whatsoever, despite the fact that they are infected. Um, in most of the cases, the symptoms may uh, occur one to three weeks after the infection. Um, it may be a sparse or a clear urethral discharge, some redness and irritation of the infected tissue, burning on urination, and some type of lower vague abdominal pain in women or testicular pain in men. How do we do the diagnosis? Well, we will need to examine uh, under the microscope and culture the secretions to identify the microorganism. Um, there is a test kit, a quick test, test kit that is able to identify the microorganism in about uh, 15 minutes. What will be the medical treatment? Um, there are antimicrobial drugs and the treatment will be a single dose. Can you see how easy it is? A single dose oral azithromycin, zithromax, or we can opt for a seven day regimen of doxycycin or um, vibramycin that are taken twice a day. In terms of alternative drugs for the treatment, those will be erythromycin, emycin, ofloxacin, floxacin, or levofloxacin, levoquin. From the point of view of the nursing management, well, we always need to make sure that we obtain a sexual history that is very accurate. Uh, will the nurse needs to follow when examining and assessing a patient that is has a suspicion of an STI, will need to follow precautions for preventing any type of infection transmission. The nurse may assist in collecting a specimen, will have to be the person that will explain and emphasize importance of the treatment and importance of adherence to the treatment and finalizing completely the, tre the treatment. The nurse will need to discuss as well methods for preventing transmission and reinfection. The nurse is essential for the nurse to advocate for sexual abstinence. Um, and in order to do that, for those that um, will choose to still be active, the nurse will be involved in teaching them um, how to prevent um, both pregnancies, unwanted pregnancies, uh, and how to prevent um, future STIs. Gonorrhea, second most frequent um, reported sexually communicable infection in the United States with an incident, interesting uh, enough, being very high in an, the age group that is between 15 and 24. Again, most of the women will be asymptomatic, and that is another factor that will contribute to spreading the disease because they are not even aware that they are infected. In terms of pathophysiology, the condition is caused by a bacterium, uh, Neisseria gonorrhea, that can be transmitted um, through sexual contact, both heterosexually or homosexually. The, infections may, the infection may affect the urethra, vagina, rectum, um, or pharynx, depending on the type of the sexual contact. From that point, from that entry point, the bacteria will spread and will 
uh, involved and um, developed throughout the entire body. Um, in the case of the men, uh, for a localized infection, um, that may spread from the urethra to the prostate, seminal vesicles, and epididymis. As a result of that, and as a result of the inflammation on those structures, um, the patient can heal developing urethral strictures um, that may require, um, as to relieve the pressure, periodic dilations of the urethra, in, or in sometimes of extreme cases, reconstructive urethral uh, surgery. In the women, the infection may spread and progress through the cervix to the endometrium and fallopian tubes, developing in, into symptoms of pelvic inflammatory disease. And as a result of that, they may uh, experience future uh, sterility. In terms of signs and symptoms, um, the men usually um, will develop symptoms in between two and six days after infection. Uh, the main uh, symptoms and the most common one will be urethritis, inflammation of the urethra. In this case, the discharge is purulent. It looks like pus. And there is pain on urination as most common signs and symptoms. A very small portion of the men will be asymptomatic, while um, at least half, if not more, of those of the infected women will have no symptoms. Whenever there are symptoms in a woman, there will be a white or yellowish vaginal discharge. Um, they may complain of intermenstrual bleeding due to cervicitis and painful uh, urination. Whenever there is an anal infection, that will be uh, ma manifest itself as a painful bowel elimination and the purulent rectal discharge. For throat infection, uh, there will be a sore throat. Uh, the pharynx will be um, um, infected. And from that point, uh, the, if the microorganism will disseminate to the entire body, the patient may manifest skin rashes, fever, and even uh, painful joints. The diagnostic is uh, done by identifying the microorganism um, through um, examination on the microscope immediately or after a culture uh, that was incubated. The medical management for the uh, condition is um, the treatment with antibiotics. Um, this germ, this bacteria, uh, becomes increasingly resistant to um, a few classes of uh, antibiotics. And in this category, I will we'll put penicillin, tetracyclines, fluoroquinolones, and sulfonamides. Um, all those are resistant. Uh, therefore, the current recommendation for treating the, uh, gonorrhea is, again, simple. One single intramuscular dose, IM dose of growth spectrum cephalosporin is rosafin, or any other third generation cephalosporin um, that gonorrhea is still um, um, not resistant to. In addition to that, um, azithromycin, Zitromax, in a single oral dose. Any sexual partners in the preceding 60 days should also be treated. So this is part of the history when we need to sit down with a client and understand what, what and whom was the which partners did they had in the preceding 60 days, because all those individuals will need to be treated. For clients with a complicated gonococcal infection as a PID or a disseminated infection to the entire body, the treatment may need to be a little bit more developed and complex. They need to be uh, hospitalized and uh, treated with um, a multiple drug therapy that will need to be um, administered IV. In terms of nursing management, um, again, we are going back to the client teaching, very similar to the teaching that we need to we describe for chlamydia. Question number two. Is the following statement true or false? Gonorrhea is easily and quickly cured. The answer is false. While gonorrhea can be easily treated if caught early, treatment must be followed thoroughly and judiciously. Gonorrheal infections can be complicated 
requiring hospitalization and multiple courses of parenteral IV antibiotics. We are moving into the next condition, uh, and that will be the syphilis. The syphilis, again, it's a curable, perfectly curable STI if treated early. Syphilis can be transmitted uh, from the blood of an infected person directly uh, from the lesion, or can be also, um, it can cross the placenta to an unborn infant. Unfortunately, the incidence of syphilis in the United States is increasing among young uh, adults, especially African-American men. Um, and it will account nowadays for about 75% of all primary and secondary cases of syphilis. In terms of pathophysiology, the condition is caused by a spirochet that is called Treponema pallidum, which is a bacterium. Um, and the average incubation time, um, that means incubation time means between the moment of infection and first occurrence of symptoms is about 21 days. However, it can range between 10 and 90 days. Whenever untreated, the syphilis will progress through three distinct stages. We'll have a primary stage, a secondary, uh, and a uh, tertiary stage. If you look at this uh, image for a second, you can see that the primary stage is between the exposure day one, and um, it can take place up to uh, 90 days. After the 90 days, most of the cases will go through what is called a systemic dissemination. For this stage one, primary stage, uh, the main manifestation will be a chancre, uh, will be a lesion uh, that is most of the time not painful. And because of that, in most of your uh, uh, individuals will go kind of un unobserved in both males and females. We have the the systemic dissemination that goes into the secondary phase between six weeks and six months when there will be a range of uh, signs and symptoms that will involve the whole body. We'll see lymphadenopathy and rash on palms and uh, soles. And after that, it's still untreated. The syphilis will go into what is called a latency stage that can be between one and 30 years that progressively will deteriorate mainly the nervous system of the uh, client, uh, leading to paralytic dementia, tabis, gammas, aortic aneurysms, or aortic insufficiency. So uh, as I was telling you before, let's review really quick before going into the diagnosis. We have the first stage that is the primary or early stage when there is a painless ulcer that will show up on the genital area at the level of the genitals or anus, cervix, or other parts of the body is totally painless and painless. And because of that, it's a small papule that will ulcerate and will heal in a, in a few weeks. And because of that, many times the clients will not want to seek help. Uh, they may not observe it even, or they will not want to feel it so it doesn't bother them. Untreated will develop into the second stage of syphilis, when the patient will come with signs of fever, um, all those signs of flu-like type of symptoms, malaise and lymph um, node enlargement, they will show up with a rash on the trunk, back, arms, palms, and soles of the feet that does not itch. They will have patchy hair loss and the headache. They may have a sore throat. And interesting enough, all those signs and symptoms will disappear without any type of treatment. However, even if this stage and the symptoms and signs will disappear without treatment, syphilis can progress into what is called the third stage. And third stage can take up to 30 years. The tertiary stage of syphilis is a non-infectious because at this point, the virus will start invading the central nervous system along with other uh, parts of the body. And you can see here some of the, um, in this um, images, some of the signs um, of the tertiary syphilis. The patients uh, may show up with gummas. You can see those uh, changes at the level of the, uh, of the skin. Um, the patients will come with uh, the destruction of parts of their um, body as the nose, the nasal cartilage will be uh, destroyed and will um, 
be will disappear. We'll have um, so again, the gammas are those soft rubbery growth of the skin tissue. They may have uh, neurologic symptoms as pabis dorsalis, which is a degenerative condition of the nervous system, the central nervous system resulting in a stabbing back and leg pain and an unsteady gait, um, along with urinary incontinence, blindness, and all kinds of other neurologic symptoms, leading to finally to dementia. Um, and they may have uh, joint disease. Uh, which is a neuropathic type of joint disease, is called Charcot joint. Now, in terms of the diagnostic, how do we uh, diagnose a condition as syphilis? Uh, we can perform what is called a non-treponemal antibody test, uh, such as a rapid plasma reagent, um, or we can have the venereal disease research laboratory, which is the VDRL test. Those are tests that we can perform on the blood. There are some specific treponemal uh, antibody tests as fluorescent treponemal antibody um, absorption or FDA ABS that will measure the number and the, am the amount and the quality of the treponemal pallidum uh, antibodies. There is a direct detection test in which usually we'll take a sample for er very early stages. We take a sample from the lesion from the chancre. We'll place it on the side and we examine under a microscope. However, most of the patients were not going to come in those early stages. What will be the medical treatment for the syphilis? Very simple one. One single dose of IM penicillin G. It is efficient for both primary and secondary types of syphilis. For those clients that are allergic to penicillin, we can give them a 14-day regimen of tetracycline or doxycycline. The follow-up exams and um, the lab tests uh, should be done at 3, 6, and 12 months after the initial treatment. In those cases that the patient is coming with a tertiary syphilis, um, the treatment may be longer and will need to include multiple doses for 10 to 14 days in order to prevent uh, complications. Um, usually, we've seen a poor response, especially in those that have um, cardiovascular involvement um, by syphilis. Uh, what will be the nursing management related to and very specific to the syphilis? Um, again, we are going back to an accurate um, acquiring of information uh, regarding uh, both the health uh, related information for that space, uh, for that client, along with their sexual history, uh, any type of allergy history in anticipation of antibiotic treatments. Um, the nurse will prepare the client, explaining the diagnostic lab test that will need to uh, be performed. There will be definitely a need for client emotional support at the time of diagnosis, especially if they are confirmed of having the condition, as well as informing the client that this is a condition that needs to be reported um, as well as uh, there is a need to notify the sexual partner, um, especially if they are in a, in a stable relationship at home. Herpes. Herpes um, infection, herpes simplex virus, HSV, is a, is a highly cont contagious type of uh, infection or sexually transmitted infection. It is controllable if we are performing uh, what needs to be done. However, it's not curable. Um, the statistics, again, pretty inaccurate. We believe that up to 20% of the population in the United States um, have an infection with herpes. Nowadays, the statistics are not really differentiating between the oral facial herpes simplex one, HSV-1, and the genital herpes, herpes HSV-2. Um, we also believe that probably um, one in four uh, people across the country uh, may have not been even uh, diagnosed. In terms of uh, pathophysiology, so we are looking more into sexual transmitted infections because that's what we are discussing in this lecture. So we'll refer a little bit more to the herpes simplex type 2, which is responsible for genital and perineal um, 
um, lesions. However, um, we can see a cross contamination between um, those two, type one and type two, type one being considered the orofacial one. Transmission is uh, done by direct contact with the oral or genital secretions from a person during an active stage of the disease. The sexual contact during periods of asymptomatic viral shedding or what is called the auto-inoculation. There is a transmission that can occur from mother to infant during a vaginal birth, and that has a high risk of neonatal mortality. That's why uh, active lesions uh, on the perineal, uh, on the perineum or um, the genital area um, during the during the during birth will mandate a cesarean section. Herpes has a recurrent pattern of happening. So after the initial infection, the virus will become dormant um, and they reside in the ganglia of the nerves that supply the area until they will go through an episode of reactivation. Symptoms um, usually um, will be less uh, severe than the initial outbreak with episodes that are shorter and uh, less intense. Whenever there is an, an outbreak, there is a shedding of viral particles that are highly infectious. Keep in mind, however, that even people that are asymptomatic can still shed the virus and transmit it. Um, on an average, someone, a, a, a client with genital herpes will have at least one outbreak per year, uh, but most of the uh, patients interviewed will report between five to 10 outbreaks per year. Um, those out outbreaks are more common in pe uh, around periods of uh, stress, emotional situations, exposure to sunlight, um, menstruation, and they may be activated by febrile uh, diseases around a flu uh, or any kind of other fever related situations. In terms of assessment, um, usually herpes has a very short incubation period and will cause a single and sometimes multiple vesicles um, in the genital area. They can be found on the penis, um, on the prepuce, uh, buttocks, thighs, uh, or cervix. The patients will complain of a burn or itch um, before those vesicles fully erupting. Uh, once fully erupted, they will be fluid-filled blisters. In about one to three days, those vesicles will rupture. Uh, usually, this at this point, they become the area becomes painful. Um, they look like um, reddish ulcers that will may scab over and will eventually um, disappear. Some of the, those outbreaks may be accompanied by swelling of the inguinal lymph nodes. Uh, the patient will go through flu-like symptoms and uh, headaches. The initial attack will last not more than three to four weeks, and every subsequent attack will usually have, um, will last less than 10 days. In terms of diagnosis, uh, the diagnosis is mainly done by uh, the client history and just by observing the lesions. Uh, we can perform smears or we can culture the lesions um, and examine them under the microscope using very specific stains. Because it's, we are talking about the virus, we can do a PCR test, with, which is a polymerase chain reaction in order to um, identify the DNA and identify the fact that this lesion is caused by a herpes virus and not any other type of germ. Um, both types of um, viruses in terms of medical management Despite the fact that it's a self-limiting infection, uh, we do need during the attacks to intervene with some type of therapy. They respond well to antiviral drugs as aciclovir, or, um, which is Zovirax, or famciclovir, which is uh, famvir. Um, the client will be prescribed oral antiviral medication uh, for three to five days in order to shorten the um, duration of the attack. Uh, or they can be prescribed continuously as suppressive ther therapy in order to uh, prevent the frequency of the outbreaks or decrease the potential of transmission to uh, other um, individuals. 
cesarean section uh, is uh, mandated and performed on a pregnant woman that has an active lesion in order to prevent the transmission uh, to the newborn. In terms of nursing management, again, um, uh, careful and appropriate health and sexual uh, history needs to be uh, acquired. The nurse will always, when we are talking about standard, uh, about sexually transmitted infections, will need to use standard precautions when inspecting any type of lesions, whenever uh, asked to obtain specimens, or to provide any related health uh, teaching. We'll need to instruct our clients regarding the following. The client needs to inform all potential sexual partners that they have an HSV infection, even if asymptomatic. The client will need to use a condom or a dental dam during any kind of sexual activity, even if the disease seems inactive. They will need to avoid sexual contact if there is any question that the infection is active. Make sure that the client will understand that the condoms or dental dams do not protect skin and mucous membranes that is left exposed. They will need to learn how to keep lesions dry using um, alcohol, peroxide, witch hazel, um, or warm air from a hair dryer. They will need to check with the physician about taking warm bath with Epsom salts or baking soda to relieve any type of discomfort when they have an attack. They will be instructed to wear loose clothing that promotes air circulation around the genital area. We'll need to teach our clients how to perform a thorough hand washing after direct contact with the lesions and how to keep any personal hygiene articles like a towel separate from any other elements, anyone in the house in order to avoid um, the usage by others. Um, your female clients will need to have an annual pop smear test to detect for the early detect um, and um, uh, treatment of cervical cancer. And the nurse will investigate stress management strategies uh, that the client has because it's known that by reducing stress, um, the frequency of the outbreaks will be reduced as well. Infection with genital human papilloma uh, virus. The human papilloma virus represents uh, the most commonly transmitted disease in the United States, and it is presumed that is affecting currently um, almost 80 million people. Um, out there, um, we know about more than 100 strains of HPV. Uh, with about 40 strains of the virus that can infect the genitals um, of the males and females, along with mouth and throat. Um, about 13 strains out of those have a high potential for causing cancers, um, genital cancers in both males and females. Um, one fourth of the people in the United States um, are infectious from those that are infected with human papilloma virus, virus, but they do not manifest any symptoms. Um, there are a few strains, um, number 6, 11, 16, 18, 31, 33, and 35, that are called um, and will cause genital warts. Those are also called condylomata. Um, unfortunately, because this is a viral infection, they have a high tendency to recur uh, after treatment. In those patients that have um, additional comorbidities, especially those that are uh, having a low immune response, is uh, patients with AIDS um, or any other immunodeficiency, um, they are very uh, susceptible. They are at increased risk to uh, develop the genital uh, warts. It is interesting to know that untreated genital warts may resolve on their own, uh, or they may remain unchanged or even increase in size or number. So the natural uh, development, the natural course of the disease um, is very unpredictable. In terms of um, pathophysiology, the HPV is transmitted by genital to genital, genital to anal or genital to oral contact with an infected person who may or may not have been symptomatic. 
In other words, sexual penetration is not necessary, uh, but not genital contact is less likely to transmit an HPV infection. Um, most HPV infections will clear within a few years without clinical manifestations, and some will persist. And those that persist may be linked to various forms of cancer. Please keep in mind that the genital HPV infection can be transmitted to an infant's respiratory passages at the time of the delivery. Um, the HPV infections are associated with uh, uterine cervical abnormality, abnormalities due to development of strictures, um, and later they may lead to cervical and other pelvic reproductive types of cancer. They are involved in penile cancer, anal cancer, and oropharyngeal cancers. In terms of uh, assessments, um, most of the infected pers clients with HPV will not gonna have any types of symptoms. In some of the patients, you will see the genital warts developing. Those lesions usually are painless. They appear as a single lesion, as a cluster, um, and usually they look like a soft, fleshy growth on the genitalia area, area or on the cervix, uh, in the inside of the vagina, um, around the anus. They can show up in the throat or the mouth. Sometimes they are so small that they may be overlooked. Um, and in other cases, they become large, raised, and they may resemble a cauliflower. Genital warts have this um, property of turning white when vinegar is applied to the lesion. Um, and um, that's one way that we can identify um, and um, differentiate them. So you have in those images different types of warts, and you can see that they are all viral and they look um, very, some of them may not raise any kind of suspicion, and sometimes you may look at them and think that they are maybe a uh, just a mole. The treatment is um, usually resection. Question number three, is the following statement true or false? If vinegar is applied to lesions suspected of being caused by HPV, they will turn white. The statement is true. To easily confirm if a genital lesion is HPV, applying vinegar will cause it to turn white if it is, um, and that will put the diagnosis of human papilloma virus. What will be the treatment now? For the HPV infection, there is no efficient antiviral treatment. Um, the best treatment will be to prevent um, the, um, the lesions by abstinence from sex or by using condoms or dental dams, and those will lower the uh, risk for acquiring HPV. In addition to that, um, for ghosts and women, typically, um, however, nowadays the uh, recommendation extended to boys and men, um, we currently have a vaccination that will reduce the spread of the infection, and as a result of that, it's uh, cancerous consequences. The vaccination, the Gardasil uh, vaccine for HPV, uh, should be administered as early as age 9, but generally between the ages of 11 and 12. Um, however, um, we are trying not to administer it after the sexual activity starts. For the genital warts, there is local treatment um, if the warts are not extensive and the client um, is able to reach them. There are um, podophyllic solutions uh, or gels. Um, there are creams that can be used for self-application to, um, and those uh, treatments um, will be done for uh, three days followed by non-treatment for four days. And during this repeated cycles of uh, treatments that usually do not need to be repeated more than four times, the uh, warts will, uh, will disappear. Whenever the warts are substantial in size or they are in location that are difficult to reach for the client, uh, the treatment can be done by a physician and the excision, the removing of the warts can be done by surgical excision with a scalpel or scissors, laser therapy, uh, electrocautery, 
cryotherapy, we're freezing liquid nitrogen, um, all these kinds of elements that will destroy the, um, the wort. The nursing management will be just like with the previous conditions that we described today, will uh, advise for avoiding intimate contact until the warts are removed, will teach about um, in how to seek treatment um, at an STD clinic um, whenever the warts return, will advise the client to contact its sexual contacts to, uh, and ask them to be examined and treated, will educate regarding usage of a condom even when the lesions are absent, uh, provide information about the diagnosis and treatment in future health histories, especially if the pregnancy will um, occur. There are a few other um, STIs um, that are less common, but we'll need to, um, to discuss them here. Um, one of them will be um, the Zika virus. The Zika virus is acquired through the bite of a female mosquito, which is the vector. Um, and the virus can also um, be spread through sexual contact. The individual that um, contacted, contracted the Zika virus will develop some mild symptoms, and those can be uh, similar to any kind of viral uh, condition with fever, may um, have a skin rash, uh, conjunctivitis, muscle, and joint pain, uh, usually lasting no more than seven days. Um, again, this um, virus can be transmitted from an infected female to a male sexual partner or vice versa, um, regardless if they are symptomatic or asymptomatic. The biggest problem with this virus is that an infected woman can transfer the virus to her fetus during the pregnancy because the virus is able to cross the placenta, um, especially if the uh, transmission is done in the early stages of the pregnancy in the first trimester and actually in the first eight weeks of the pregnancy, um, some um, fatal um, birth defects can happen uh, by um, having an abnormally small head or a lack of, of the cranium completely, which is called microcephaly. Uh, when the cranium is, is present, there will be developmental delays and mental retardation um, in, those, um, in those patients. In terms of uh, how can we um, teach our patients and what we can say about it, um, we can teach them of, uh, regarding avoiding travel around areas where Zika virus is present by controlling um, the environment where mosquito will breed, such as standing water and eliminating them, staying indoors, especially during early morning and evening when mosquitoes are most active, um, have screens around windows and doors, applying um, effective insect repellent, wearing long sleeves, shirts, and pants whenever outdoors. Um, now going into safer sex practices, just like with our previous conditions. And waiting at least six months after returning from an area where Zika transmission is common before trying to conceive. Another condition um, that is also sexually transmitted is a chancroid caused by Haemophilus ductrae bacillus. It's an infection that is very rare, um, was last reported in 2010 in the United States and has subsequently not reoccurred and is characterized by the appearance of a macule that becomes a vesicle and finally develops into a very painful genital ulcer that is enlarged, will have tender lymph nodes in the inguinal area and um, is opposed to the um, um, condition with the syphilis where we have the chancre that is totally um, I'm painful. Um, this one is uh, severely painful. The condition is treated and can be cured with azithromycin, ceftriaxone, uh, uh, ciprofloxacin, or erythromycin. Just to summarize for you the prevention methods that are, are and should be included in the um, patient's education will be abstinence uh, to abstain from sexual activities, um, will advocate 
uh, monogamous sex, use of condoms and dental dams. We'll explain the importance of urinate after sexual intercourse, the importance of maintaining hand hygiene, and how to not um, have unprotected sex. In terms of condom use, um, we'll need to educate our patients on how to use them uh, correctly. So we'll educate, first of all, into selecting those condoms that are lubricated and will contain a spermicide uh, or they are silicone uh, condoms. We'll explain why not to use natural membrane condoms because those will uh, act as a barrier to sperm. However, will allow viruses that are very small to pass through. All condoms need to be stored in a cool and dry place. We'll need to explain how to discard condoms that are beyond their expiration date, um, especially if they are more than five years old. We'll explain why not to un unroll and examine a condom before it's used or use one that appears to have deteriorated because we, the membrane, the, the uh, condom itself can become perforated. When applying the condom, we'll explain how to pinch the tip of the condom while unrolling the condom over the erect penis only. Unroll the condom all the way to the base of the penis. There should be um, use of additional water-based lubricant to reduce friction and prevent tearing of the condom. And the patient needs to avoid oil-based lubricants because those can uh, weaken and destroy the latex. We need to remove the condom from the vagina before the penis becomes slim. The condom should be disposed in a lined container and there is a need for a new condom before each sex act. The silicone-based lubricant is needed to prevent the condom from breaking and the silicone will not deteriorate the latex. We'll also explain our clients that during anal sex, the risk for breakage and slipping rate um, of the condoms are increased. Regarding the dental dam, we'll need to uh, explain the importance of purchasing a commercial dental dam or construct a rectangular piece of latex from a condom or a glove. The nurse will need to explain how to cut the tip from the condom and unroll the condom before slitting it lengthwise to form that rectangle. Um, the same type of process should be used when cutting a piece of latex uh, from the palm of a disposable glove. Always make sure that there are no holes or tears in the dental dam. Optionally, water-soluble lubricant can be applied to the surface that will be against the vulva or the anus. The dam will be placed against the vulva or the anus and hold it in place during sexual activity. The dental dam need to be disposed after a one-time use. 